to Science Show Live. Today we are learning about trains. I've got an epic story time for you which might change your mind about trains. I don't know. Um, we've got two activities, one, two, and at Noah, if you're here, then your journey out of bed has not been wasted because we are doing Dinosaur Discovery of the Week. But first, a very quick science history news. This week, by beautiful coincidence, uh, in 1866, the first proper train robbery happened in America. So before then, people had like snuck onto trains while they were waiting at stations and stolen stuff. But this was the first time that anyone had got in front of a moving train in the middle of nowhere and stopped it. And because there were no police or sheriffs around, um, the Reno brothers who thought of it got away with $13,000. Um, and the best bit of this story is the solution. So um, the train company started doing quite obvious things, like they, they made big strong safes to put on the trains um, so that people who were robbing them couldn't get to the money. But they also, some train companies added an extra carriage um, which had police in it, or like sheriffs and horses, so that if anyone stopped the train in the middle of nowhere and tried to get away with the money, loads of like the police would come out of the train and chase them. How great is that? Um, and finally, in science news, this week, this week, at Christie's auction, a uh, fossilised T-Rex just broke all records for how much someone has spent on a dinosaur fossil. This T-Rex skeleton, nicknamed Stan, went for and over 24 million of our British pounds. It's a really cool skeleton because it's nearly complete. Um, two of its neck bones are fused, so scientists think that it broke its neck and then survived. It's got like 11 inch teeth. Um, the sad bit of the story is, we don't know where it's gone. It was an anonymous bidder on a phone call and scientists are worried that if it's a private collector, then we, we might never see it again and they might not be able to study it. So there you go. Just a, a little issue for you to think about. Right. Noah, if you are there. He, Noah was furious last week that we didn't have time for Dinosaur Discovery of the Week. So before we get into all of our train activities, we're just going to do Dinosaur Discovery of the Week. Let's go. Right, we are in a place where we've been before. In the late 1800s in America, lots of scientists were competing to find the best dinosaurs. Uh, we called it the Bone Wars this period, and someone called Othniel Charles Marsh discovered a long-necked, that's your clue, long-tailed fossil of a huge dinosaur that he called a Patasaurus. That is not the dinosaur we're discussing today though. He then found an even bigger long-necked, long-tailed dinosaur and called it the Noble Thunder Lizard which in Latin is Brontosaurus. And then another fossil was discovered that looked a little bit like an Apatosaurus and a little bit like a Brontosaurus. It was like halfway in between. And some scientist called Elmer Riggs said that he thought that they were the same dinosaur. And dinosaur discovery naming rules say you have to go, like now all these are the same dinosaur, we think. You've got to go with whichever one got the name first. And it was called a Patasaurus first. So suddenly, Brontosaurus didn't exist and we had to call them Apatosauruses instead uh, for a hundred years. And then the hero of the tale, a group of scientists led by a Portuguese dinosaur spine expert, they did a study. Right, look at this picture of an Apatosaurus, okay? Imagine that you've got to say how many bits there are. How many bits do you reckon it has? Now I'm a physics teacher, so I would say like head, neck, feet, tail, maybe eight bits. Hi, Grace and Hattie. Um, yeah, these, these dinosaur experts, they studied in 2015, 477 different bits of 81 dinosaurs. This study was nearly 300 pages. It took them five years. They traveled to all different museums all around the world, looking at all these different dinosaurs and concluded Brontosaurus is a separate kind of dinosaur after all. Yay! It's got a higher, less wide neck. That's the difference. So apparently other scientists think that this study is absolutely amazing. They did beautiful detailed drawings, loads of work. It set a new standard. But more importantly, we get to use the name Noble Thunder Lizard once more. Right. I hope you enjoyed Dinosaur Discovery for the week. Thank you very much. 
for your suggestions. Um, oh, about dinosaurs. Nice to have some feedback. Right, it's, it's time to learn about trains. We have to learn about trains immediately. I'm going to look at this, look at this diagram. Let's see how prepared I am. Behold. It is going to get better than that, honestly. I'm going to fill in with some details now. So, let's get started. Right, um, I ha thing, thing I haven't drawn, the very important thing that Thomas the Tank Engine doesn't, doesn't have, is what's this bit? Train fans. This bit is called. Gordon's got one, Emily's got one, Henry, even though he's rubbish, he's got one too. This is the tender. And the tender, if you're a big, powerful steam train, uh, you need to carry all the coal in around the back. And it's got water in it as well as the tender. So first thing we'll mention is this fire box. It's not rocket science. The fire box has the fire inside. And the fire box is on top of a grate. A little with, bit with holes in. And that's so air can come up through the bottom of the grate. And if you saw my uh, home editing lesson last week, you know that fire needs oxygen to burn. So air coming up through the gate gives the fire more oxygen makes the fire in the firebox burn really really hot and coming off the firebox are these things which are called again it's not rocket science this stuff fire tubes so all the smoke and uh, carbon dioxide and all that stuff comes off the fire and through these fire tubes now i said that this tender had water in it as well and the tender has an injector coming from it which injects water all around the fire tubes and this bit is called the boiler and this is super clever this bit because if the fire tube was just one massive tube then all the water wouldn't be able to, a lot of the if the fire tube was just one big tube a lot of the hot air going through the tube would be wasted it wouldn't make contact with the water but because there's loads and loads of small fire tubes, that means that the water gets all between and gets very hot very fast. Oops, that's not blue. So all this water heats up very quickly, turns into steam. What happens next? Let's do an activity and find out. Right, for this one, for this activity, you will need some kind of glass bottle. Wine is fine. I'm using a milk bottle um, and just a bowl of warm water and some washing up liquid. So. Put the warm water in the bowl, if you haven't already, and then put some washing up liquid into the water and give it a little swish. What we want to do is dunk our glass bottle into the bowl and make a little bubble form over the top of our glass bottle. Okay, so I'm giving this a swish. Oh, that's hot. It'd be good though. Good for the activity if it's hot. Right, so I'm doing, I'm doing this kind of little dunking move here. Obviously, if you haven't got this with you, half nine on the morning, isn't it? But you could try this later. Yeah, so I've got... Yeah, well, I've got a sort of weird collection of bubbles there, but we'll go with it. So first of all, observe what is happening. Not very much. Put some bubbles in my bottle. Now, just wrap your hands around it. If there's anyone else in the room, get them to do it too. The more surface area on the bottle, the better. Just put your hands around and, and now see if anything happens. If it does happen, it might happen quite slowly. Can you see? There is some movement there. Tiny, tiny little. Oh, come on, don't let me down, you guys. Mm, this is pretty. This is pretty I'm, on, I'm live. This is all going live, you guys. Come on. Move it, please. Do so. Oh, it's rubbish. Maybe I need better bubble in there. There you go. It's this, oh yeah, that's better. This activity does work best if there's a big temperature. Dip. That's better, look, I've got a nice clean bubble. So what is happening when you put your hands around the bubble is that you're heating up the air inside the bottle. And when air particles get warm, they vibrate more and they move around more and they move away from each other. So yeah, 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 here we are. So this creates something called air pressure. Now, because there's more collisions going on inside this bottle, there's more air particles bouncing around, hitting the sides of the bottle. Um, they want to get out of the top of the bottle as well. Well, they, they um, try and get out of the top of the bottle, but they can't because I've put this bubble here. Let's give them a bit more energy. Let's put them inside the bowl of warm water now and see what happens.
Hey, look at that. Such a beautiful, simple little activity this, isn't it? There you go. So why is that happening? That is just air particles inside the bottle that have got loads more energy now from my warm water. Um, so they're taking up more space. Look, they're taking up that extra amount of space. See? Isn't that cool? I, don't, I mean, we've got loads to do. We've got a whole other activity to do with ice, but just want to stare at this beautiful bubble. I'm going to put it down now. You guys can carry on having fun with that while I'm talking, can't you? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to our steam train. So we now know that water particles, they turn into steam. Wow, my blue really looks like my black. Okay. Um, and they move up the little particles of steam, water particles that have turned into vapour. They rise and they hit the dome. But the difference between our milk bottle bubble and this is that the boiler can't get any bigger. Now, in the olden days, a lot of boilers would explode. This was a big problem when they first invented locomotives. Um, and there's a little... Uh, valve in the dome where if the pressure gets too much too many steam particles hitting the sides of the boiler the driver can release the steam and then because a lot of accidents happened they even stuck a little whistle on the side of the dome so that the escaping scheme steam moved through the whistle and that's why you get that little woo -woo. isn't that nice it's an electric uh, electric bell now that you hear on trains disappointingly but that's not really the point of the steam the point of the steam is to go down a tube, down, down, down here, into something called the cylinder. And in the cylinder is another awesome thing called a piston. This is very clever. This is how the train actually moves. So our steam comes down here and it, first of all, it goes through this tube and gets to here. And because um, the steam is taking up a lot of space, it pushes the piston this way. And then a little valve closes here, so the steam has to go down this side, and the steam appears on this side, so the piston moves the other way. And then that valve closes, and the steam has to go down there, and then it ends up there, and then the piston moves that way again. And you see what I'm getting at? This is why a train says... It's that piston moving from side to side. But how is that making the train work? Well, this piston is connected to a driving rod, which is attached to the driving wheel, see? And that makes the driving wheel go round. And the driving wheel, they've thought of everything, is connected to the other wheels by this coupling rod. It makes all the wheels go round. How good is that? Now, oh, and finally, 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 you're wondering where all this old steam has gone and all this horrible carbon dioxide and stuff from the boiler. It all comes here into the steam box and then up through the chimney and makes that beautiful. We feel guilty because we know it's not good for the environment, but isn't it gorgeous? Steam and stuff comes out of a steam train. Have a little look at that diagram. <laughs> um, which bit do you think is the most complicated bit? What is the most complicated bit of a steam train? And indeed, some textbooks I read said a modern train, the most complicated bit of engineering. It's a massive, massive engineering challenge is this. It's actually not really anything that you see. Um, it's the relationship between the wheels and the track. Now this is where I started to get really interested, right? Because this is just some beautiful physics. Let's imagine a train track, okay? Going round a corner. It's the corners, the corners that are causing the engineers such trouble. So here we've got a curvy, curvy train track, right? Um, let's put some, let's put a train on it or a carriage on it. So let's imagine that they're parallel. So those are the wheels of a carriage. And those are the wheels of a carriage as well. See, it's turning the corner. Can you see that the distance from here to here is a lot more than the distance from here to here? That's a massive problem for trains. I mean, how, how does that work? How a train could solve that problem is um, these wheels could go a lot faster than these wheels. So they cover that distance at the same time as this side goes a little short distance. That's, that's not going to work, is it? That's not possible. They can't make some wheels go faster than other wheels. The other thing they could do is, um, have you ever had a race with someone on a bike and realised that they're kind of cheating because their bike wheels are much bigger than yours? So if you've got big wheels on your bike, you only have to pedal once and your wheel goes a long distance. Whereas if you've got a little bike, you've got to pedal every pedal. It doesn't take your wheel as far. So what they could do is, they could make the wheels on the outside of the corner 
bigger so that they cover more distance and they could make those those wheels smaller. But that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Because then when the train goes straight again, you've got a wonky train and like sometimes the curve might go that way and it just that wouldn't work. The way they have got solved this problem blew my mind. Right, so if you're at a train station, you might see a train wheel and it, and it just looks like a circle. But underneath, if you turn it around, what? <laughs> I can't tell if I've been doing this for too long and I'm so nerdy now that I'm impressed by anything. But look at this! It's, so what happens is, you know how if you're in a car or on a roller coaster, if you go around the corner, you experience being pushed out to the side. It is the same with train wheels. So imagine that my fingers are a track, train going along the track. When it turns around a corner, these train wheels experience uh, this push just like we do. And they do this. So now look. The train on the outside, the wheel going on the outside, is actually bigger than the train wheel on the inside. Isn't that, isn't that clever? I just love that. And then, but then it just settles back down again and, and the wheels are the same size when they go straight. I had uh, fish and chips for my takeaway this week and I'm very pleased that these wheels also have a bit on them that real train wheels have. This bit is called the flange. It's a little flap which stops the train wheel completely leaving the track and they reckon one of the most complicated bits of engineering when it comes to trains is this flange pushing on the rail as it goes around corners how do you which leads us to our next activity let's just do it you will need a spice jar full of rice and a pencil and all you have to do is um <laughs> Did just about manage to keep a straight face on Thursday. What you need to do is. Uh, it's not That's better. So push your pencil into your spice jar of rice and then take it out again. Comes out pretty easily, doesn't it? Now <laughs> plunge your pencil into your spice jar of rice again and again and again and again, multiple times. Apparently, having done a lot of research on this, it's best if you stab it in different amounts each time. So stab it in a bit and then stab it in a lot and stab it in a bit and then stab it in a lot and keep going. And then after 30 or 40 times, apparently, again, you should be able to do that. What? Now this was already a bit compact, so you might have to do it for longer. I did it for a lot longer on Thursday. It was kind of mortifying. But look, how, how good is that? Why is that happening? It's happening because of something called friction. Friction is the force where things rub against each other. And sometimes it's really useful. Like ice skaters don't have much friction. That's why they can slide around. You want a bit of friction on your train wheels or the train wheels would slip off the track completely. But you don't want too much friction or the flange and the rail will get worn out. So trains um, on the train tracks they've got greasers automatic greasers so it used to be that there was a little button and when the trail train rolled over the button uh, the button got pressed down and some grease came out onto the track this wasn't great um, because you got something called fly off it was going too fast not good for the environment just like oil spraying everywhere um, a lot of drivers they want to brake on corners and brakes because of the friction made the wheels hot and that burned off the grease. Um, so it's really really complicated science behind greasing the rails. Um, now if you've ever seen a tiny little solar panel on a stick connected to a little grey box that is quite possibly an automatic uh, rail greaser because I, I, I had seen those and I didn't know what they are and now they do that's why I love this stuff. Um, and even the lubricant is, is proper hard science. Like if they just use the sort of Vaseline stuff that you put on your lips, apparently that gets into cracks in the rails and then the flange pushes it further into the cracks and the cracks get bigger. So there's even like special secret recipes for rail lubricants out there. Um, but I've, I've said on Thursday, I've read s some websites that I will definitely not be going back to, but I'm glad all this knowledge is in my head now. Right, is that enough about trains for you, train fans? Is it time for story time? I think it is. Okay, I just need to set up my, my epic introduction, because like I say, story time is a two-parter this week. The first part was last week, 
So I thought, some of you, train fans, you're going to be new this week, so I need a way of catching you up with what happened last week. So if you can see where I'm going with this storytime introduction, then you win a point. Just, just If there's ever a pause, it's just because I'm jabbing my ancient and cracked phone, trying to turn the screen around. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. Just building tension. It is a period of unrest. England's ancient woodland is a unique wildlife habitat. Its soil is rich in fungi and microorganisms. The new railway line, High Speed 2 HS2, will cut 30 minutes off the journey from London to Birmingham and cut through some ancient woodlands. HS2 say not that many woods will be affected. The Woodland Trust says yes, they will. HS2 says they'll plant 7 million new trees and shrubs. The Woodland Trust says that's not the same. For one thing, ancient soil is irreplaceable. HS2 says they'll dig up some ancient soil then and put it in the new forest. The Woodland Trust says, what, what? No, that's not what we, no, the soil's in layers, what do you, no, that's not what we meant. In August 2019, the government said they'd rethink HS2. It might go ahead or they might cancel it. One month later, the government announced that they still weren't sure that the railway was going to be built, but they were going to let HS2 start chainsawing the ancient woodlands, just in case, you know, just, just to kind of let them get prepared. Uh, the chainsawing, just in case, did not go down particularly well with locals who live near uh, the ancient affected woodlands. Wildlife TV presenter Chris Packham said that the chainsawing, just in case, could hurt rare bats, and he threatened to take the government to court. So everybody agreed to stop the train soaring until 2020. HS2 said, we must strike a sensible balance between keeping the programme on track and recognising that some works cannot be undone. Wildlife TV presenter Chris Packham said, for now at least, the ancient woodlands are safe. In December 2019, contractors for HS2 walked into a Buckinghamshire nature reserve without permission, sealed off the public footpaths and cut down some trees. They said later they got the woods confused and thought that they did have permission to do it. The owners of the wood don't believe them. They had to walk past a lot of really pretty prominent signs, um, and they seem to have deliberately cut down the best bat habitats. So live bats are protected by law and might have stopped the work going ahead. April 2020, the government announced that the HS2 project would be allowed to proceed. TV wildlife presenter Chris Packham lost his case in court. HS2 began relocating ancient woodland straight away, and not earlier than they said that they would. Uh, the Woodland Trust said to do it at a time of year when the woods are full of life is adding insult to injury. The impact of wildlife such as nesting birds and breeding badgers will be a lot greater at this time of year and it hugely increases the chances that moving the woodland soil to another location will fail. In July, that's July this year, protesters uh, entered ancient woodlands in the Colm Valley and attached themselves to trees and each other so that HS2 couldn't start work. Some of them built tree houses and lived in them. And security officers had to saw through the handcuffs. Dogs were trained to pin the protesters down. Um, but uh, one protester did say, um, the security and the protesters, they're not the enemies. One protester said, a successful movement is non-violent. You respect your so-called opponents. The changes we need are for their children too. They're just doing their job. So in September, 2020, HS2 got legal help so the protesters could be arrested and construction formally started on the railway. There are a lot of personal stories involved in the building of HS2 from locals who care about the woods and you often hear about those in the newspapers. But today I thought we'll concentrate on one example 
of something that's happened in HS2 that is a bit less emotional, hopefully involves some numbers we can look at, okay? So, Whitmore Woods, in between Birmingham, that's better, Whitmore Wood, in between Birmingham and, wait for it, Liverpool, there you go, is going to lose the most ancient woodland of anywhere. So the Woodland Trust say it's going to lose an enormous 5.5 hectares. I had to look that up, it's 55,000 square metres. Uh, now the Woodland Trust say that one special kind of deep tunnel would save that wood from destruction, but that that option has so far been rejected. So I was like, well, there must be more to it than that. There must be a really good reason why the government don't want to build that tunnel, because no one hates woodland, do they? Uh, so I looked at the report on the government website, and it says uh, the deep tunnel was considered but not selected because it, uh, the benefits of the environment, they didn't justify the extra cost. So it wasn't worth the money, basically. So I thought, well, maybe that deep tunnel isn't actually going to make that much difference. Like, maybe the Woodland Trust want to spend a million pounds to save three ladybirds and a worm or something. So I looked at the report a bit more and it was quite confusing actually. I'm gonna show you it, you don't have to read it all. I've, I've highlighted some bits for the people who wanna read it later. Um, it's quite confusing because it sounds like they're saying that this super deep tunnel is just really, really good, okay? So um, so the, the deep tunnel was not selected. Um, it was considered to be significantly less complex than the one that they chose. Um, highway works would be reduced uh, disruption might be avoided and it had environmental benefits. This is one they didn't choose, I had to keep checking. They wouldn't have to demolish as much stuff, there wouldn't be as much farmland lost, um, the woodlands would it'd be much better for the woodlands and ancient woodland and water gorges and heritage assets, there'd be less noise. But then right at the bottom it says um, we didn't choose that tunnel because of the significant cost increase compared to the one that we chose. We chose the cheaper one. Is, were they correct? Like, was it worth saving the money? We have to know how much the tunnel costs, don't we? So I did a bit more research. Max, that tunnel was going to cost them an extra £100 million. Is that too much to save a woodland? Um, you need some context. So the HS2 is now predicted to cost overall... £106 billion. Pounds. Um, that's twice the amount they said it would cost in 2015, which, um, if you don't want to bother with the maths, it, that means that the £100 million is 0.1% of the overall cost to save 55,000 square metres of woodland. Um, I'll just leave you. You can decide for yourselves. They haven't spent that much yet. The HS2 is being worked on right now, but the main work starts in around 2024-25. If... Everything goes to plan. <laughs> oh, that was an absolute epic adventure, wasn't it? Thank you very much, people who stayed all the way through to the end of that story time. Hello, Millie, to cheer me up at the end. Um, yeah, so it's, it's totally up to you. Like Some of you are massive train fans, so how do you feel about HS2? I would be very interested to hear, because every website I read was really convincing and used fantastic language to persuade me that they're ideas were right and I have my own opinions now but I'll let you form yours and um, thank you so much for joining me what time is it it feels like wow it's it's 10 o'clock we've crammed all that into half an hour I've learned so much I hope you have as well thank you so much for joining me um I know that you know, like so many of you are patrons here already but I have to say this a little bit now if you haven't liked my Facebook page I really appreciate you liking my page Again, um, all the old lessons that I ran over lockdown, they are, which is how this started, they're on YouTube. If you want to go to my YouTube channel and watch them and subscribe, that would be great. I almost certainly would not be carrying this on now were it not for my amazing patrons who have signed up on the website Patreon to support me with three or five or ten pounds a month. And you get, oh, the next magazine, it's coming, it's coming, it's nearly finished. Sign up with five pounds a month, you get the bi-monthly magazine that I write and... If you sign up with any amount per month, then I send you these cool rainbow glasses that I found, which apparently will be very good for bonfire night. And there's like cookbook and yeah, little little thank yous on there to say thank you. So if you really like these and you want them to continue, I would very much appreciate your support on that site. And, you know, thank you everyone who is here who is already supporting, because I know I'm really preaching to the converted here. Grace and Hattie, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Uh, all that's left me to say is very... Have a lovely Sunday, Finn. Have a lovely time in sunny Manchester, and I'll see you very soon. Oh, if you haven't looked yet, 
go on my events page because I've just released information about the panto I'm doing this year, which is just online like this, called, it's hard to pronounce, called The Little Astronomer Maid. Do you get it? The Little Astronomer, The Little Astronomer Maid, The Little Astronomer Maid. Yeah, Ian probably sums it up. <laughs> Bye! <laughs> See you soon, folks. <laughs> right, I'm going to... Oh, Anna, you're... Yeah, thank, thank you. I did do a lot of research, but it was totally worth it. Bye, Luca. Bye, Deborah. Oh, you're very welcome. Au revoir, ya ya. Noah says he still likes trains, but he doesn't think they should go through special places. Noah, what a fantastic answer. Wow, this is so simple. <laughs> you, should, you should maybe write a letter <laughs> to the Houses of Parliament. Oh, Liv, I'm glad you like that. Thank you. I'm glad. I feel like the, the more epic and complicated I make the story times, the, like, the truer truer the believers are that, <laughs> that finish. Bye Marta, bye Mike, bye everybody, I'll let you go, have your breakfast, get dressed, have a nice day.